Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for coming on behalf of the family. It means so much, you know, in times like this, you don't know what you'd say, but you know, a lot of times you don't have to say anything. Just seeing each other's faces, you know, getting to feel the touch of a hand, the, the, the smiles, it's, it all, it's so significant. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that this is, this is true religion, not to hide yourself from each other in, in times of need like this. You have to bear with me. I'm not the most technically savvy among us, but we are, I, we're doing something here. And uh, <laughs> Grandpa Dick, I hope you can see us. Kristen, hello. God bless you. Um, it is my honor and privilege to be here with all of you today. Uh, Suzanne asked me in, in her final days if, if I would do the honor of eulogizing her. And with all sincerity, I was able to look her in her beautiful face and tell her, you know, eulogizing you is going to be an easy thing to do. You know, as beautiful a person as I have ever met. And uh, I told her at her bedside that, that when this time came, it would be one of my greatest honor and, and privilege to be here with her friends and her family and on her behalf and upon Dick and the family. Once again, thank you. Let's open in prayer and then we're going to have a song. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you. We adore you. We thank you for the gift that this great woman has been in all of our lives. Your word says that every good and perfect thing comes down from you, Lord. And, um, God, we know she wasn't perfect, but she was awful close. She was so beautiful. She is. Lord, we just thank you that, that you assure us in your word that you are the God of the living. You say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had passed from the eyes of those that were walking this earth, God. So we thank you that she is yours and you are hers. And I pray, God, particularly for Dick and for the family right now, that in this moment, you'd bring a comfort, you'd bring a peace. And we just uh, thank you that you can do miraculous things like this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll have this song on Eagle's Wings.
goodness. I know we're not supposed to clap right now, but gosh, <laughs> I, I really would. That's amazing. Thank you guys so much. So beautiful. Fitting. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen, if you'd come, John, I'd I, I like you to be the, the, the lead-off batter here and um, just come and, and, and share the words that you got on your heart. And uh... So, most of you may know, but just for those uh, who didn't quite understand the pastor's comments about uh, Dick and this the technology here is, mm. Uh, Dick had a stroke yesterday, uh, so that's why he's he's not here. But he's he's alive, uh, and it wasn't a bleeding um, stroke; it was a blockage stroke. And because of blood thinners, he's 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 doing as well as can be expected. So the intent here today is to to videotape this, and then afterwards, over here on the side, I have other videotapes so you can give a message to him, so we can we can share that with him. So I'd ask you that you. Share with the video. Also, please sign in on the on the book with a with, with a message. Um, the display up here represents our, our mom. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in in, in my remarks. But uh, she was quite a lady, and she, and she traveled uh, in her life. Uh, she always said she was proud of her kids, but we were very proud of of, of her. Um, Remarks today, um, I started working on when I was sitting with her um, dinner, during her, her final days as to what things that remind me of her. And so the first, first story is this broom. <laughs> she was an avid neat freak. I mean, she was, <laughs> she would, she was constantly cleaning. And when we lived on, uh, on Tamarack, my brothers and I, um, we'd be sitting on the back seat, and we'd pull in the driveway, and we'd start counting, because how quickly did it take for mom to get out of the car, grab that broom, and start sweeping that front porch? I mean, we were just, it was, it was like a lottery ticket. <laughs> the other thing was, she was hard. She was, she was hard on checking your rooms. She literally did white glove inspections of my bedroom when I was growing up. So West Point in the Army was easy. I mean, you know, I mean, she, she set me up, she'd come in there, she'd run her hand across the top of the doorway and I'd go, come on. I don't know where she got her from, but she was, she was, she was, that, she was that lady. Um, she was a great gardener. I mean, she loved, loved gardening and doing different things. But again, it was gardening with a purpose. And we got to a point where she was, uh, she had a Japanese, she wanted to do Japanese rock guard. And so we would give to her on her birthday or some type of gift, two things. The first was so many holes. Okay? <laughs> because when you dug a hole for her, it had to be so many inches in circumference and it had to be 18 inches down. And it was 18 inches all the way down. And she'd bring out a ruler and she would measure that hole. <laughs> and she would always pick the dirt that had not been dug in for years, all right? So you were going to go ahead and pick on it. And we got to the rock garden. And it was how many moves of a boulder you would do, all right? Because she'd always do it on the side of a hill, all right? And it wasn't a small rock. It was a big boulder. And I'd say, okay, you know, here it is, with love, three boulder moves, you know, in your, in your, in your rock garden. So she, was, she had that, that, that piece. Um, flowers. She, she was all about flowers and, and, and that beauty. And we kind of showed that. We put flowers on the table, and we'd ask you that you take those with you, all right? Those are, and they're, they're, they're living flowers, to take them and, and, and plant them in your home and, and let them remind you of, 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 of Suzanne. She, she always made a house a home. I mean, I never felt more welcoming than, than coming up to, her, to, to the house. Because you drive up, there'd be colored lights in the windows. Some of the candles that we have here, her house has, was always there. Um, there's a clock here. If you ever stayed with, uh, with Suzanne, the clocks were all through the house, and none of them were set to the same time, right? <laughs> Literally, through the night, you were not going to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> Because the clocks kept going off all different times. She was like, you're driving me crazy. But that's just the way, the way she, uh, she, she worked. Um, 
her house looked out of something out of home and garden. I mean, she could take something and like this, and it it looked good wherever she put it in the in the in the house. It was it was it was amazing. I'd do something like that, and I don't know what to do. At first, I wouldn't buy it, but you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it it helped as we as we went forward. Um, she knew her mind. I mean, she was a she was a driven lady. But she went back to school in her in her in her in her, in her 40s to get her nursing degree. I mean, 40 straight straight A's to go go and do it. And then she started her own business. First massage, massage therapy, and then one of the cutting edge in terms of therapeutic massage. I mean, I, I question, you know, energy fields, but it worked. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, then there was the crystals. I mean, I have crystals in here that she, that, that she gave me, you know. Um, <clears throat> but she was always kind of working. She was a health nut. How many people have seen that, that movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, right? <laughs> Remember the Windex? For mom, it was Sunbreeze and Cali tea. <laughs> Whatever went wrong, you either could drink it with Cali tea or you could go ahead and put Sunbreeze on. And that Sunbreeze would take the skin right off your body, but you were better. When I, had, uh, when I was going to the West Point prep school, I came down with a severe case of mononucleosis. I couldn't swallow. My throat was, was so sore. And they finally said, go home, take 30 days off, and get as much sleep as possible. So I was in Fort Bell, Virginia, rode home to, uh, to Tamarack Road, walked in the door, told my mom, I says, I'm, I'm sick. All you want me to do is go to bed. So I went to bed. An hour later, she woke me up. She says, John, I go, what, Mom? She says, you need to eat these bean sprouts. <laughs> I'm going, what? Yeah, eat, eat these bean sprouts, they'll make you feel better. So I ate the bean sprouts, go back to sleep. Hour later, John, what? Time for more bean sprouts. <laughs> okay. Open up a third time. Mom, no more bean sprouts. Just leave me alone. I didn't see you for a day and a half. <laughs> but. It was, she always had health foremost in, in her mind and, and giving it to her family. It, sometimes we questioned it, you know, but we, we, we took it. Um, she was a great uh, environmentalist. You know, she was always just recycling things, mulch, yard waste. <laughs> we always laughed because we'd go in the house and she would wrap stuff in wax paper and secure the rubber band. I was always wondering, what did the rubber band do? I mean, you know, they keep something else to go forward. But then in the later years, if the paper towel wasn't completely used, she'd fold it up and stack it right up there. And I think, I go, Mom, what are, we, what, what are we doing with these paper towels? She's very religious. She had a religious journey that started out as a, what I call high Episcopalian, uh, Lutheran, Missouri centered um, unity. And then back to uh, traditional, what she called traditional church. But she always had her faith in, in, in God and, and felt very strong right up to the end. It was always like, where's God, wherever God's what, you know, will for me, I'm, I'm willing to go ahead and, 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 and do it. She was, you know, uh, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, a great grandmother across two families, and then a friend to, to folks. But it's, it's interesting. <clears throat> I've been very lucky in that I've had five generations of women who've impacted my life. My two grandmothers, my mother, my wife, and then my sisters, uh, my two daughters, and then now my uh, granddaughter. <laughs> and I'll share with you a story that kind of shows how all those different generations kind of were used to manipulate me. <laughs> <laughs> so we were in England. And we were there for a year, and um, the British Army goes on block leave. And so my mom came over for block leave. Dick didn't come over with him. And for this, I'll always have a bone to pick with him. <laughs> so we were going to go to Scotland. Um, we have uh, ties to the Rose clan, and, and the Rose ancestral home is up in, um, in, in Scotland. So we we're going to take a, a drive up to Scotland. So it's me, Joan. Kathy and Carolyn and mom, we have a Volkswagen bus. My mode of operation is you drive until the gas tank is empty, then you take a break. 
<laughs> so mom comes. We start out, drive along about 45 minutes. My mom was in the back seat, in the middle seat. And she says, John, I'd like to stop. Mom, we, we got plenty of gas. We're, <laughs> we're good to go for another couple hours. She says, no, I'd like to kind of stop, get something to eat, <laughs> walk around. And Joan's in the back going, yes. <laughs> so she says, I see an opening. So we pull off, you know. So then it's now every 45 minutes, we're taking a break. My time schedule's out the, out the window. So we're going up, we're going to Edinburgh, and Joan says, well, Suzanne, why don't you sit up front next to John? I'll sit back here with the girls so they can plot, you know? <laughs> so we're driving up, and we're on the road to the straight into Edinburgh, and, and from the back, she says, you know, Suzanne, the Waterford Crystal Factory is right up here if John takes a right, and they have tours. It's pouring down rain outside, you know? So we pull up. She goes inside, she says, they have tours, but no kids are allowed, so we'll leave the girls with John. And I go, okay, so we'll go play in the playground, right, in the rain. So then, in, in Scotland, every town has a woolen factory. And every, of course, we had to go to every woolen factory in every town. And I had to try on a sweater to see if it would fit Dick for every woolen factory in every town in Scotland. So this got to be old. So finally, we're coming back, and um, we stop in a town called Moffat. We're sitting at bed and breakfast. And, uh, and it, was, it was Sunday, Sunday in Scotland, and this was like 1983, you know. We're sitting down at breakfast, and... Uh, I go to get the car and bring it up, and Joan comes out. She says, you know, Mom wants to go to a woolen factory. I says, absolutely not. You know, we're done with woolen factories. She says, fine, you tell her. I go, I will. <laughs> so Mom comes out. She says, John, I go to a woolen factory. Mom, we're not. You know, we've, I've tried on 500 sweaters. She says, I really like to go. So this is 7 o'clock, right? Says, All right, we're going right now. I says, if it's closed, doesn't matter if it's open up. Drive up. There's two tour buses that have been open since six. <laughs> just take a picture of me. This is how I spent my Scottish vacation. <laughs> she loved birds. You see the bird, the bird feeders up here. She, you know, she got great joy in just watching the, watching the birds. Uh, she loved animals. Uh, she had the cat Tigger. I mean, she was always telling you Tigger stories. She talked to Tigger. Tigger talked to her. I'm absolutely proof of the conversations that that they, that they had. She loved her red car, you know. Oh. Dick would call it Miss Chin. Miss Chin's talking to us, you know. But she loved that red car. And, you know, I think she would have taken it with her if she could. <laughs> um, she was always dressed to the nines. I mean, there was not a lady. Of course, in later years, it was the three to four hour prep. So, you had, you know, if you're going now, start, you know, start, that, start, start that time clock. I went to Capon Swings, Capon Springs every spring and, and fall. They'd open it up and, 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 and close it down. And they loved that place. Um, spent a number of winters out in California with my uh, California brothers. Um, she loved the beach. She loved outdoor showers. Never went in the water. <laughs> Why go to the beach? And I think if she would have had it, she would have designed a house with an outdoor shower. She just liked to shower outside. You know, be able to kind of look outside. <laughs> She was big on angels, guardian angels. I got more angels in my cars, you know, in my wallet and everything. It was the guardian angels that she always gave to watch, to, to watch over you. Um, she was a great shopper. She would shop at uh, Salvatore Army and uh, Gucci. Oh, that's Salvation Army and Goodwill. <laughs> <laughs> she liked nothing better. If you wanted to make her happy later years, Take her to Salvation Army Goodwill. She was just so happy. It was like, you know, all the bargains she would bring, bring back from there. And then last, before I turn it over to, uh, to my brother, is humor. My last story. Um, I don't know. I was like seven or eight. And I was homesick. And my brothers really terrorized my mother as we were growing up. I mean, you know, we did. She would line us up the phone, call my dad, and then he would tell us he was going to be us when he came home, and, you know, but, and he did. But anyway, so I'm sick. She gives me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. 
I'm eating it. And she says, how is it? I go, it's okay. I'm eating it. And then what had happened is she had put a black olive, which I hate, in the center of the sandwich. And I ate it, and I go like, what are you doing? And she laughed. She thought that was so funny. I go, how do you torture a child, a sick child, like this to go forward? Fast forward to the end. We're sitting with her, and um, my sister Kirsten comes in at the end of the day. And uh, mom was on her side. She was looking at me. And the Kirsten says, how you doing? And she opens one eye. She says, I'm still here. <laughs> so she was a great lady. Um, I miss her every day, but I know that she's, uh, she's watching over us. I know she's touched everyone in this room in, uh, in, in some way. And I think we're all better uh, because she was uh, a part of, our, part of our lives. And with that, I'll turn it over to the to talk. I heard some things there that I'd forgotten about. <laughs> so like John, I thank you all for coming. I know mom's touched and smiling from above. S thanks to Cindy. Where Cindy for all your work on the ground mm -hmm. to make all this happen. So um, mom was a hero for me. My mom was, had a tremendous influence on in my life. And the man that I stand before you is mostly because of her influence. I find it fascinating of the synergy and the wisdom of the universe May 11th, which was last Wednesday, that was the 46th anniversary of our birth father's death. And then here we are celebrating mom's transition as well. So I'm going to share three significant, powerful philosophies and qualities that mom imparted to me and continually to demonstrate it to me till the time that she died, passed away. First one, when one door opens, another one, excuse me, when one door closes, another one opens. Number two is, it's all about relationships. Who in this room has heard my mom say it's all about relationships, all about relationships. And number three is live your truth. It's all about relationships. I'm honored to say that I have a friend here that I met in the seventh grade, and he's still a very close friend, and his wonderful mother, Joanne. And I see John has a friend here in the 40-some year range, and Woody has a family and friends here in the 40-some year range. So that shows you a very powerful demonstration of, of it's all about relationships. So they said, Mom, our birth father died in uh, 1970, and then four years later, Mom married Dick. So I'd say, well, Mom, you gave yourself quite a situation to live. Let's see how well you're going to live those three qualities right there. Um, I could think of no better situation to do that. Um, as well as, like John said, going to college as well. So we're going to lose your husband. We're going to go to college. We're going to marry a man who nine, had nine children, and then we're going to see how we do. <laughs> you know, nice work, Mom. Um, so really, I can't imagine, you know, an environment like that as a young mother, you know, taking all that on and, and showing the eloquence and the grace and the continual demonstration of these three powerful, powerful teachings that had such a significant impact on me. In fact, I remember a story I gave mom a number of years ago. I had the idea to give mom a collage of the mom, you know. I left. I was, the parents got married in 1974. I, it was my last year of high school. Then I left Maryland in 1976, right after John and Joan got married. So mom was wonderful about how sharing, you know, things that she was into. Like, you know, this is a representation of, of the, the, you know, wonderful tapestry of interest and philosophy. And so she would just very lovingly send us things and books. And so anyway, I got an idea to, I saved all that. And I, I, I assembled this collage. It was really fun. I, us Bartley brothers aren't too art creative. Thank God we had a lot of women helping us on this um, because this would have been quite a project for the four of us. Um, but I, it was really fun, and so I gave it to her. I, I sent it off to her, and, and she, many a number of years later, shared with me how powerful it was for her as a parent that it confirmed that, you know, as a parent, I, those of us that are parents and grandparents in the room, I think we forget, you know, when we share something or we impart something, what kind of effect that has on our children. And it was a tremendous, she shared with me, it was a tremendous confirmation for her when, in seeing that collage and all those years had transpired. And, and so I, my sense is that even now, again, as I shared, I left many years, you know, shortly after my parents were married. And most of my influence comes from after I've been gone. So I think all of us need to remember as parents and grandparents we continually have a very, very strong impact on our children and grandchildren. Is that right, guys? 
So I'm grateful for the time that we had with, with the parents. The parents came out to California in June of last year. Thank you to everyone in this room that helped make that happen. That was some of the, the sweetest memories I'm going to take for, for the rest of my days. Um, one of my favorite memories, the parents love Doc Martin. I know some of you have given them. So on Thursday nights, Doc Martin was on. And we would tape it because we were working a little bit late and then we would agree on a time that we were gonna watch it. And then many times we would go up to the room that Stacy and I had let them use our room and we would all assemble. Mom was usually on the bed. We have a coon dog there that she grew to really, really love. Um, some of us were on the bed, some of us weren't. And, and we would watch Doc Martin and it was just pure bliss for mom. I mean, she had the show, everyone was there. It was just, it was a very, very special memory. Also, I had many, many memories the way our schedule, we all, my two brothers and Stacy and I and dogs, and we have a lot of moving parts in our house. We kind of have a family commune in California. And the way our schedule worked, there were many times where I had one-on-one -on -one time with mom. She would get up in the late morning and just the way my schedule worked, and I would have one-on-one, one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one time as an adult son for five and a half months. That's like the greatest gift I think one could ever ask for. Um, <clears throat> so in November 2010, we lost our sister Nikki. And then one week, excuse me, yeah, one week to the day, we lost a family friend who was also our computer person, who actually the parents knew when they spent time out. So we lost our sister Nikki, I forget which day it was in November, and then seven days to the day later, we lost his friend, and I can remember coming in the house that, day, that morning when we, his name was Mike, and it was worked out, and Jim shared with me that Mike had died, and I said, wow, you know, just working, having experienced loss many years ago with my dad, and then Nikki, and then this friend, and I just, I, I, literally, I sat down. It hit, it hit me that hard. I just sat down, you know, what's the message here? What's, and it was, again, right before Thanksgiving, and for me, I said, you know, let people know that you love them right now. Don't, you know, don't wait. Let them know now. And so I, some of you in this room, I sent letters, hand wrote letters out and just said, look, life is precious. Thank you so much for being a part of my life. And it took, you know, a couple weeks to do that. And then something told me I should reach out to my wife now, Stacy, who I didn't really know that well because Stacy's sister is married to my fourth grade friend, Wally. And it just kept coming up reach out to Stacy. I said, that's weird. Why would I reach? I don't really know Stacy, you know, and you reach out to Stacy, you reach out to Stacy. So finally I, I acquiesced. I said, okay, I didn't even have Stacy's physical address. I just had her email address. So I reached out there and just said, obviously it wasn't appropriate to tell her I loved her at that point in time. <laughs> I, know, I know we move fast, but not that fast. So I just said, you know, I hope you're doing well. You know, my sister has passed away. I, we've lost a family friend. Life is precious. I really hope you're doing well. And, and as they say, um, the rest is history. We, we chose to speak over the phone for two months and then Stacy came out. And so lo and behold, I've created a version of what our parents created because Stacy does kids and grandkids real well. She has six children and 11 grandchildren and I have two children. So we've created a version, a 21st century version of what the Bartleys and Brinsenhoffs has created. So thank you, mom. You know? <laughs> um, have we not, a couple of other interesting notes is Stacy's birth father died actually the same year that Ham died in 1970. And then Stacy's mom just died on February 28th. So we have some interesting parallels, um, kind of like we're destined to meet. So. Um, and lastly, as John said, Mom took a really, really fascinating spiritual journey. Um, she, I always tell, she's the one that turned me on to New Thought and, and such. And then towards the end, in our many, many shares, you know, she, you know, she would look right in my eye and say, "Trust Jesus, Dom." You know, I said, "I do, I do, Mom. I trust Jesus." And so. What I want her to remember, you know, as this door, Mom, has closed on this experience in your life, and I know the afterlife has opened up big time for you, um, that I am trusting Jesus. For absolutely, and I thank you for being the most wonderful mother that a son could ask for. And God speak to you. Hey, Dad. <laughs> Kristen. Very nice. I'm Becky Faraday, uh, Dick Brinsonhaus's oldest daughter. We have many young people in our family, so <laughs> I'm the oldest of them, and uh, of our two families of 13. So um, what I would like to do is um, share uh, Suzanne's testimony when she became a Christian four years ago. 
Suzanne became a Christian. And if she were here today, I almost wanted to turn this around into her voice, but it was a little too difficult to, <laughs> to do that. But um, she would be telling you that for most of her life, she listened to Twittering about God, but they, did, they were not words that led her to the one true God. In 2011, Suzanne joined me uh, at my church of Covenant Life and for a course called Introducing God, followed by a book study, Walking with God. And she said, as, as during that time, her thirst to know Jesus, what? Nice and loud. Oh, I'm not loud enough? Okay. Um, so during those two courses, uh, Suzanne's thirst to know Jesus began to grow. And one day she sat down with a new friend who told her that Jesus, the Son of God, became man and walked on the earth, demonstrating the love of God through many miracles. And lastly, Jesus fulfilled his mission by taking upon himself our sins and dying on the cross. And three days later, was raised from the dead by his Father for our forgiveness. At that point, Suzanne received by, faith, received by grace the faith needed and accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior, forsaking all other false hopes. She purchased a study Bible. It was at least this big. And it was in weight, it was about half of her own weight. <laughs> and she told me that Dad would bring it to her every night and take and put it away after she finished her readings. When she initially got, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she proclaimed that Jesus told her he would take care of her. And when she later was diagnosed with cancer, having, again, she found her solace in Jesus Christ. Jesus was very faithful. Though there were many changes due to her health issues, she had a quality of life very much supported by her wonderful husband. In the last weeks of her life, her body and mind began to give way but her love for Jesus and her trust in him did not waver. When I would read the Bible to her, which dad would say, go in and read to her, because when I would read the Bible to her, she was most alert, almost as if fresh water were being poured over her. One day I was reading the Gospel of Luke and she had the biggest smile on her face. And I said to her, Suzanne, soon you will see Jesus face to face and he will hug you. And she said, I will hug his feet. Suzanne waited patiently for Jesus to come and get her, but she was so ready to go. And as John said, the day that Kristen came in, maybe a week before she passed away, and said, how are you today? And in Suzanne's very dry humor, she said, I'm still here. <laughs> Giving evidence of her desire to not be here. Suzanne slipped away sometime after midnight on the 23rd of December, while sleeping next to the love of her life on earth, to live forever with the one who loved her eternally. So it's interesting that the doors kept opening. I kind of find that fascinating. I kind of find it very, very divine and a symbol that mom's here. In fact, quick story, we went out to dinner just the other night and we went to Bassett's, which is this lovely place right close to where we're staying. And it was busy, we went on a Friday night and there was a long line of people so they said, Woody, go up and put our name on the list, see what's going on. And they typically will send the youngest child, you know, it's like a scout out in the beginning. And so I went to talk to the people and I said, hey, you know, I'd like to, how long's the wait? And I'd like to put my name on the list. And she said, well, how many people do you have? And I said, well, I have seven people. She said, well, you know, we'll seat you right now. And I thought, wow. And I called up the rest of my family to pass all these other people in line as they gave us, you know, the dirty eye. So I think about, wow, what are the chances of that and just all this to say that I feel very much the presence of our extraordinary mother here today and as my brothers have said this amazing woman who walked very very softly she was probably the most classy person I have ever encountered in my life had this not only in her appearance but in her mannerisms as well so I'm going to talk about four different qualities Tom talked about three and there's going to be some overlap if you'll allow us but I wanted to start with, there's a wonderful reverend, is Reverend Eric Butterworth, and he was a longtime unity minister. And he had an opinion on something that was a little counterintuitive. And what Reverend Butterworth had talked about is that most people assume that a child wants to have a stuffed animal to comfort them. And Reverend Butterworth said, actually, I think the truth is, is that the child wants to have something it can love. 
Because we are hardwired for love. We want to express our love. We come out of the womb and we walk on this planet wanting to love. We are loving machines. And mom certainly was that. I mean, she was a lover. As much as mom loved to live, she lived to love. That was what her whole purpose was. And I think, in my opinion, mom had four posts, four foundational things that she built this extraordinary life on. And the first was, as Tom had mentioned, it's all about relationships. It's all about relationships. And I heard that. And I'm the youngest, much younger than my brothers are. <laughs> and, and I heard this in the background when I was growing up. You know, it's one of those things, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it. And then as I got older, I realized, wow, you know what? Mom was right. It is all about relationships. It is all about connection. It's about connecting. We live on this planet with a lot of other people, and we're not meant to walk our path alone. While we have solitude, we're meant to be in communion with other people. And I believe that connection creates the possibility for wellness. It creates the possibility for happiness. It creates the possibility for fulfillment. And mom taught me that the simplest path and the most direct path, the shortest path to connection is through the fluid space of curiosity. There's a great innocence in curiosity. Judgment is very sticky. Curiosity is very freeing. And the quickest path to curiosity is questions. Just ask questions. Because if we, as we have been told, if we become like little children, that's when we'll enter the kingdom of heaven. There's innocence, there's fluidity in, in, in curiosity. And what do little children do best? Or my brother Jim. What do they do best but ask questions? They're always asking questions. And they have no shame about asking questions. They just ask a lot of questions. And what's interesting is children don't ask closed-ended questions. Are you OK? They ask long, open-ended questions. They say, how are you feeling? What do you like to do? What's your dream? What makes you happiest? What do you like to eat? Where do you like to go to school? And I think, and again, my mother was instrumental in this, is the first most basic question that leads to a powerful connection is, what is your name? You know, from the time that we are born till the time that we die, we are known by this name. And names to me are very, very important. And I've developed an ability just to remember names, not because I have a great memory, but because it's important to me because it's what my mom taught me. And I remember a story when my mom was newly married. She worked for a company. And one of the vice presidents was giving a tour to one of the VIPs. And again, mom was newly married. And the VIP not only remembered her name, but remembered her newly married name. And more than 60 years later, when my mother told me that story, you could just see the presence of feeling important, feeling significant, feeling like she mattered. And I believe, again, that a name is the simplest and the shortest path to making this connection. And it goes back to this whole extraordinarily important aspect to my mother, and I now have adopted it as well. It's about relationships. It's about relationships. The next tenant of my mom's life was you don't have to grovel. So I was a young man. I was in my teenage years, and I was sitting in the hallway in our house on Lori Drive, and I was on the phone to some young woman, and I was selling myself. You know, this is why you need to be. I am your man. You just don't realize it. I need to change your opinion. And it was all about just trying to convince this person that I was who I was, about literally begging this person to be in connection with me and be in relationship with me. So after the end of the phone call, I went into my bedroom. Mom's study, where she was studying for nursing school, was just across the hall. So I went into my bedroom, and I closed the door. And underneath the door, on a little 3 by 5 card, said, you don't need to grovel. And I remember, even at that tender young age, to realize, wow, you're right. And behind that was, you don't have to grovel. You don't have to convince anybody to be, to be with you because you are my son. Mm -hmm. And we can look at the grander scheme in God's eyes. We are God's children. There's nothing we need to do to convince anybody that we are who we are because when we were born, we were all that and a bag of chips right from the womb. <laughs> That's who we were. And what's interesting is, in understanding that you don't have to grovel, that leads to self-acceptance and self-awareness and self-confidence. And ultimately, it leads to self-love. And when we love ourselves, we can love other people. And when we can love other people, we can develop relationships. 
So the whole thing becomes circular. And when we develop those relationships and we have those people who are in our immediate circle and then the ripples go out, it is what I've heard, it's like an Eden of camaraderie. Wherever you go, you have this experience of being in relationship with people. You have this experience of being connected. Like there's this heartfelt experience and it makes the difficulties and the challenges of life a lot more easy to manage when you feel like you have this sort of connection. So the next tenant of the four was mom talked about that moderation is the key. So when my big brother John got married, he had a bachelor party. I wasn't old enough to participate. A couple of my brothers, and we won't mention names, got a little too excited. Maybe participated with a little bit too much enthusiasm and then experienced the physicality of those choices the next day. And what was interesting was mom, on a small little piece of paper, didn't even go inside the room taped it on the outside and it simply said, moderation is the key. <laughs> and you know what's really cool about this? And this speaks volumes about my mother. That was her method of communication. It was very simple. It was soft-spoken. It was almost plain. But it was not wrapped in judgment and confusion and anger. Instead, it was wrapped in patience and understanding. And, and right on top, it was adorned with the bow of compassion. And that's what mom was all about. That if you live in moderation, it makes your life be in balance. Because too much sunshine is not good for you. Too much work is not good for you. Too much rest is not good for you. Too much play is not good for you. Too much drink, too much food. Too much is excess. And excess will ultimately lead to imbalance, and imbalance leads to difficulty. But on the flip side, if you can live in moderation, life becomes just a little bit more easy to manage. And this last tenant, these four posts upon which my mom built her life was, has been said, is laughter is the best medicine possible. Mom loved to laugh. We grew up watching The Carol Burnett Show. Mom loved Tim, Tim Conway and Harvey Corman. Harvey Corman, thank you, Lucille Ball. And mom loved to laugh. And these were good, big belly laughs. I mean, it wasn't just like a little timid laugh. It was a big belly laugh. So to honor my mother, of course, I got to tell a joke. So this man brings his dog into the veterinarian. And he's confused because he's gone to a lot of different doctors and he doesn't quite know what the problem is. And so someone says, well, you got to go see this vet. He's got all these specialties that he can employ, all these different methods to be diagnosed, diagnostic. So the guy brings the dog in and the vet looks at the dog and says, hmm. He says, hold on for one second. Goes into another room, comes back with a cat. And so the cat looks at the dog, walks around the dog, comes back around the other side of the dog, starts to knead on the dog a little bit, walks over the dog, comes back over the dog, and then connects, gaze, connects the, his gaze with the doctor. And the doctor says, hmm, I got it. And says, you know what, it's a gastrointestinal issue. I think I know exactly what to do. I can prescribe some medicine. And he says, that'll be $2,500. And the guy says, what? He says, your cat just walked around my dog and started a need on him a little bit, and you're going to charge me $2,500? And the doctor says, I'm sorry, let me explain. It's $100 for the visit. It's $2,400 for the cat scan. <laughs> and with the pastor here, I'm going to end with one, one more joke. One more joke. So a little girl and her mom go into church. And the little girl's a little hesitant because she doesn't quite understand all this whole church thing and what a pastor does up front. So the pastor starts and says, Lord, we are but dust without you. And the little girl looks at her mom and says, Mom, what's butt dust? <laughs> so forgive me, but mom believed that when we laugh, our very soul smiles. So you can imagine your soul like the center, like right in your solar plexus. When you laugh, that's what your soul does. It smiles. So at the end of the day, as mentioned, that mom loved to live, but she lived to love. And that she created this life about, it's all about relationships. It's you don't need to grovel. You don't need to beg life to respond to you. That it's great to laugh and that moderation is the key. And... I think it's natural for any of us that when we get to the end of our turn in this human existence, we want to look back at the scoreboard and think, did I, did I achieve my goal? Did I live successfully? And I love Emerson's 
this empirical benchmark that he came up with, and I'll read this, in which the question was, what is success? Success is to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a better place, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, that is to have succeeded. And I say, Mom, in the final accounting, you are, without a doubt, the most successful person I've ever known. I love you, Mom. If there's anyone who would like to come up and say a word about Mom, this is the time to, to come up. Please, the mic is open. I'll make this very brief. Uh, my name is Red Arwood, and I have a band at Cape and Springs twice a year. And it's very interesting. Uh, got to, my wife and I got to have a real relationship with uh, Suzanne and Dick. And uh, they would, uh, as they told me, they would gauge their, their stays when the band would play. We would play once in May and once in October. And uh, so we got to be really good friends. And of course, they had certain tunes that they liked and whatnot. But the greatest thing was every time we saw them for the first time, it might be for when we got together to eat and whatnot in the dining hall, they were all, I mean, hugs. It was just so much fun. It was like a long lost relative that we hadn't seen for several years. And then the second thing and last thing I'll talk about is the morning that the band would get ready to leave. There, there are six guys in the band. And the morning we get to leave, they would sit at, with some friends in a different part of the dining hall, but they would come over to our table and everybody would hug them at the table. And it was so interesting because Suzanne would, was always so genuine and so loving and caring. And I told Marilyn, I said, you know, they, they really have to be two of the best friends we've ever met out here. <laughs> and uh, I've been doing that for 22 years. And I can say that, that I don't know how many years that they, they were coming, but I've seen them for a long, long time. And uh, I hope the, Cindy, I hope you and everybody else uh, tells uh, Dick that uh, we have him in our prayers and whatnot, but I just want to tell you all the relatives and whatnot, friends, that Suzanne and Dick were wonderful people. Hi, Grandpa Dick. And I, this is just something I want to share about her. I didn't have as much time with her as a lot of you did, um, but this is just a story of Suzanne. Um, maybe a year ago, I spent some time with her and Grandpa Dick. We were, I was there with my husband, Stephen, and our two boys. And I have a neurological condition called synesthesia, which basically means my senses are kind of scrambled. Um, when I get an auditory input, I have a visual response in my mind's eye. So whenever I hear a noise, I also see a color. So I thought it would be fun to do a portrait of us with uh, Dick and Suzanne, uh, just drawing our colors uh, in an abstract way on a piece of paper. This is something I do for fun. So I need to listen to the sound that I want to draw. I need to catch the color. And um, I listened to Suzanne. I said, go ahead, just, just tell me something. Just say anything. And I don't remember what she said. I never remember what they say. But I remember the color. So I shut my eyes, and I listened to her. And when I opened my eyes, I said, how do you feel about lavender? <laughs> and she put up her eyebrows. <laughs> and she said, go look in my bedroom. <laughs> and, if anyone was in the bedroom, it was this beautiful shade of purple, a little more vibrant than lavender, but um, I, I just wanted to share that through that gift that I have in the strange way that my senses are wired, she was lavender, which I, is a color I know she loved very much. Thank you, Kari. Two quick reminders, um, and we still have a little bit more to go, so thank you for indulging us with uh, this opportunity to honor this extraordinary woman. As mentioned by John, there are plants on the back. Please feel free to fight over them to see who wants to take them home. And they're living memorials of what mom's greatest artwork was. She painted with flowers. In addition, there is a bench that is going to be at Black Hill Park. I think I have the name right. So go enjoy the bench, sit, laugh, and think of mom. And at this point, I'm going to ask my brother Keith to come up.
and then we're going to have the soloist sing after that, and then Pastor's going to bring us home. So the technology, I have a text message from my dad, so <laughs> which, which, which I'll share to you. But you know, before I speak, I'd like to you know uh, share with the Bartley brothers here how important you are to me, and it was just it was so fun to hear you speak. You're just so handsome. You're smart. You're funny. Uh, John, I never knew how funny you were until the last few years. <laughs> I was just, it's great. So I just really, I really reflected as I was sitting here, reflected on her, Suzanne and her wonderful sons and how wonderful it's been to be brothers with you. So thank you. Thank you. So, um, to, you know, Cindy reached out to Kristen, Kristen talked to Dad, Dad told Kristen, Kristen texted, and now, <laughs> and now I'm here, right? So, uh, so from, from, from a Dick Brinsonoff, uh, we had a good life for 41 years. You know what? It's been quite a chore getting used to being single again. You know, it was wonderful being a partner for all of those years. Literally wonderful. It was very important. But it's also very nice to be a caretaker for Suzanne in the last year. I love Suzanne very much. And then after he had finished this, he was talking to Kristen and he was saying, you know what, I, boy, I sure am glad that all this business, which he meant the stroke, um, held off until after Suzanne died, mm. right? Because he really didn't want to have anything to interfere with his caring for her. So um, thank you all very much, and I really appreciate being able to speak for my father here this evening. Thank you. I think that this, that aspect of service was very much what my parents lived every single day. It was about being of service to one another and service to their family and service to their community. So as mentioned, the folks went to Capon Springs, I think, for it, multiple decades, 30 plus years, and they went in the spring and they went in the fall, and, and really they went to hear this music, this music that was just part of their very soul. So if laughter made their, their soul smile, so did your music, very much so. And with that in mind, mom's favorite song, probably one of many, was I Left My Heart in San Francisco. It meant the world to her, and we're going to be treated to a rendition of that right now.
Well, there we go. Wow, beautiful. Thank you. When we started this service, I, I welcomed all of you and I said that it was my honor and my privilege to be with you in this time. Um, it is my honor because Suzanne spoke with me and invited me into this moment and it has been my privilege to to be here. The words that everyone has said so far have been so significant and so worthwhile. I'm reminded of the Bible verse, uh, Proverbs chapter 31, where it talks about the woman of noble character who can find her. And it talks about the fact that her children will rise up and call her blessed. And I think we have been witnesses to the fact that she is this woman, you know, that was talked about in that chapter. Another passage came to my mind as we were together, and it says, Blessed are the sons born to you in your youth, for when you stand at the gate of your enemy, you won't be turned back, you won't be dismayed, you know. And um, as we've stood at these gates, you know, at this, which is humanity's greatest challenge, which is this expanse that we all are destined to cross, you know, we stand in this moment unashamed, we stand in this moment assured, and we stand in this moment blessed because the love of a mother has really made a path that has been plain and easy to follow. The only other words that, that are on my mind as we get ready to close uh, at this time are thank you to you, Dick. I, I hope this broadcast is coming through to you. You, you, you lived out um, a perfect display for all of us, the display of Christ loving the church. You know, I, I, I feel a little bit like Neil Diamond here of late. I have to do a lot of these weddings. It seems like all the time, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like the wedding singer, you know, but, you know, but I tell you what, every time there's a freshness to it. And, and, and every time I get ready to step into that supernatural moment, a lot of times these young people have no idea how supernatural it is. I can just feel the Holy Spirit grab me by the coat and say, hey, 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 take it easy here. This is supernatural. This is a divine time. This is the mystery, you know. And as Dick said the words about being thankful that this stroke business came after his duties were done, he was so attentive to his duties. I don't think either one of them could hear very well there towards the end. And, you know, I, I remember standing in their whole front as glass, and standing there and just, just you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be a peeping Tom, just no one would come to the door, so I was standing there just watching Dick attentively with focus and energy and class, such classy people, you know. Jesus, the Bible teaches and says, Husbands, love your wives as God loved the church, as Jesus loved the church and laid himself down for her. You know, so many times I would, I would bear witness to this with my eyes and I'd say, hmm, yes, this is well done. This is, this is done right. And uh, I pastor Difference Makers Church. It's an awesome church full of criminals and, you know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, I'm not actually. My buddy, Pastor Ray Sheck, pastors the Lutheran church in town where all the police officers go and I tease them. I say, yeah, all the cops go to your church, all the robbers go to my church, you know. Um, you know, there are interesting people of which I am, you know, and, and I, I, I like the way there's a lot of grace given to each other. You don't have to have this right, just be heading in the right direction. You know, and as these testimonies, as these stories have been told today of this great woman this great woman of the faith, you know, she has figured this stuff out and she's laid a path and she has been very insistent, you know, that, uh, you know, those that are coming behind her know where she's at and know where she's going. I mean, time and time again, she would, she would assure me with just the confidence and the peace that, you know, my words are unable to describe. She's like, I'm okay. You know, I've got great peace with Jesus right now. You know, she's looking at me and making me like nod, like, you get this? I'm like, I guess. I mean, I, I think I get what you're saying. You know, she's like, you need to make sure. You know, which is why, you know, she, she dreamt of this moment 
well before this moment was upon all of us. And I think, again, I think you guys have, have, have done her justice, and I think you have done Jesus justice, the one who has loved her the deepest and the longest and the most. And for all of you that are friends and, and other family members and, and participants in this time, I think we are, uh, you know, I think it does us a whole lot of good to, uh, to trust this great woman, you know, and to be grateful for the gift that she has been to us. The wedding ring that we usually pick as a token or a symbol of the mystery of marriage, it's got no beginning, it's got no end. You can't figure out when it got started or where the Smith left off his work, you know, and it's the same with this love that, uh, that we have observed here and that we're a part of. Let's join together in prayer as we close our time out together today. Lord, um, there are many things we could have done this afternoon, but it's been good for us to be in your presence. Father, it's been good for us to, to quietly reflect on the gift that this great woman, Suzanne, has been to all of us. And we just wanna thank you for her. We wanna thank you for her life. Lord, um, I'm sure she's, you know, doing something interesting with you right now. And uh, however you do what you do, please let her know how deeply she's been treasured and uh, how her words and the example that she's given have been honored today. And God, I pray you'd give us grace to continue pursuing you. Give us grace to draw closer and closer to you. Lord, if everything good comes from you, we've seen so much that has been good in her. Lord, and we want you to pour that kind of goodness and even more into the rest of our story. So we thank you for hearing our prayers. And we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you again. Uh, take time to, to love on each other. We're, we're welcoming you to come and eat with us. And awesome. I could hear 12 more songs. It sounds like we've got at least one more song, though. So again, thank you all for coming. A couple of reminders again, uh, over in that corner, my daughter Brooke's gonna be over there. If you'd like to have a message to, you'd like to share with Dick, she'll be 
ready and waiting to video you and then we're going to be having some food here very shortly so please continue to stay around and join us and we uh, look forward to more fellowship and sharing thank you